I think that art's always been part of me. In other words, I never learned it. I always had some artistic capability. And I mean, as growing up, in formative years, you don't think whatever you're doing is art. You just think you're just doing it. Very early on in my years, my grandmother used to be my caretaker in Ciudad Juarez while my, both my parents worked across the border. I was moved, I was transported from that area to an East LA school at, uh, at the age of about seven. One of the things that I saw that was very prevalent was I didn't really did see the, the, the uh, there was, you know, uh, there was always this talk about racism. Well, I never saw it that much, but I did see the discrimination. But it was actually the discrimination between the Mexican-American versus the Mexican nationals. And so for me, coming from El Paso, even though that's in the U.S., but predominantly speaking Spanish, right away, uh, of course, as a kid, you pick up very survival skills and you pick up these things because, you know, you want to survive, especially in inner city schools. I was fighting this, these kids at the time. Simply not with what they did to me, but what they represented, mm -hmm. right? And it's and it's like to me it was being I was feeling feeling ashamed because anything I knew of Mexican was my grandmother. So my very first painting I ever did was actually a respond to that. A lot of people think it was something a political statement, but in fact it was just a reflection of what was I was experiencing, experiencing mm -hmm. it. And my, my very first painting is actually a kid. Uh, wrapped around with the Mexican flag from his waist down and everything in the bottom have real iconic imagery of m a Mexican uh, icons. Uh, you see a toy, Mexican toy, the Loteria, the playing card type of uh, 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 a church, uh, a Chile, a guitar, a Zapata, all very earth tone colors uh, in the bottom and he's like trying to push himself out, out of it. And then on top, very fantasy baby blue colors like a sky with a TV, a, a TV and a and a history book on both sides of his head with eyes and hands, and sort of controlling his mind. So you know, so this was my own way of sort of uh, dissecting of what was going on and the indoctrination that was happening towards me. In my high school years, this is early sixty nine, sixty eight. There used to be a trend of two different thoughts when it came to art. The trend was art for art's sake versus art having a message. For me, I used to use a lot of symbolism because I used to tell a story about what was going on with my life. So when I used to do this in class, in the art classes, my teachers would confront me and say, you know, you're really, that's not really art. And so you're not really going to be an artist, right? So I really took it at heart that I wasn't going to be, I wasn't doing art. Uh, because I was using too much symbolism and art doesn't necessarily uh, come from, you know, just coming out of symbolism. And so I, I, uh, so I really never paid it any mind in terms of me being an artist. Maybe I just was a graphic uh, illustrator, or I don't know, but not as a fine artist. So I really yeah. never pursued, you know, uh, yeah. academically uh, an art career until way when college, only because my interest was in the arts, but my, my, my first major was actually sociology. I started doing silk screen posters uh, right after high school, right in my college. I went straight into uh, the university at Cal State LA and just started, just influenced by other artists. I did a uh, a drawing of uh, this one based out of uh, a Che Guevara's famous quote about building a new uh, 21st, what do you call it, 21st century man. That it must, uh, it must not be a, either a product from the past, the corrupt past, whatever, and nothing, you know, so it must be a new future. And so I, that imagery came into mind, the 21st century man sort of uh, uh, breaking the chains of oppression around the world. They were a lot of a Cuban influence, probably at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah a lot of Latin Latin American influence. Mm -hmm. Yes. The more the propaganda posters were the kind that you would just want it one simple color. Mm -hmm. We used the cheapest paper as possible, and you wanted to do that purposely, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, because the the cheaper paper it is, the thinner it is. The thinner it is, the more. The, the more effective it is when it to go out snipe, what you call sniping, mm -hmm. because you use this uh, uh, flour wheat uh, paste, mm -hmm. 
And so it becomes part of the wall. You can't peel it off. It would just tear. Well, we used to uh, we used to organize our our our, our poster or our, our sniping brigade, <laughs> which it was just a bunch of youngsters, two or three o'clock in the morning, used to go out and just go bombard the streets with posters. Sometimes you're you're what you're trying to do is politicize and educate. Uh, uh, back in those days, certain populations that normally are not your type of populations, they would actually pick up a brochure or a flyer and read all the text. So you wanted to capture their attention by a strong imagery and something that they could relate to. So I think it was very effective. Other stuff that got used was more informational, where you there's more text, um, you know. And it, it, I used a lot of statistics to kind of show the contradiction. You know, pig Bank of America, pig Chiang Kai Shek, pig or pig Nixon. You know, has killed, and then he would have a number of so 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 many so many uh, American soldiers, so 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 many Vietnamese soldiers, and you see the difference. So so many blacks and Chicano. You see the discrepancies of the numbers, right? Uh, anyway, and then you know we say off the pig, and you know you're talking very radical, militant type of. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you were afraid to put your name. Well, on. of course you wouldn't put your name on those. No, I, you, uh, you, are you kidding? No, you would, you know. Especially they were after any. They were in a wish hunt. Actually, I got arrested one time having a bunch of posters in my car, and I had no warrants, no tickets. I had nothing wrong, but other than having those posters in my car, I was part of UMAS, and then became Mecha. UMAS was United Mexican American Students. Then later on, their name got changed to Mecha Movimiento Estudiantil de Chicanos de Aslan. Mm -hmm. And uh, that name change was adopted after the Plan de Santa Barbara. Uh, we used to have national and statewide conferences mm -hmm. uh, on, the action, on the actions that we were going to be taking. And so there was a lot of decisions made. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, we were part of that group. Uh, I was working along, not part of, but the Brown Berets, for instance. The Chicano Moratorium happened in 1970, and I had graduated in high school from in 69. So I was just fresh out of, out of uh, high school. It, it, it's very important because this is the first time that... Well, first time also for m many things for the first time. First time that there was a, a gathering of that magnitude and that size in the city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And it was about 28,000 people. Mm -hmm. I like that. That was, that was one thing. Another thing, it, it, also, it also unified not only ethnicities on, on, mm -hmm. on the matter, which was primarily the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. but secondary, it was the high death rates of Chicanos dying in Vietnam because mm -hmm. we made 28% of the casualties when we only made 7% of the population. So that discrepancy. So... Uh, but also different nation nationalities, and as well as being a national Chicano moratorium. Mm -hmm. So it was a wonderful thing to see, the unification of people, you know, off towards one common goal or one common demand. Everything had been planned and so that no trouble would be caused, because, uh, especially for the organizers, because it wasn't a rally just for of militant mm -hmm. young kids. But it, we had families, you know, we had grandmothers, we had children, children, people, you know, mothers with children, you know, with, with strollers. And so uh, when the police attacked the rally, uh, people responded and a riot broke out. And that's where three people got killed, one of them being Ruben Salazar. So I placed a significant role for the Chicano uh, movement only because it's a, like a, nation, a national a, a day of resistance, but also it plays... Um, it also changes, historically, changes a lot of things because that's when you start seeing, you know, this was even after the Watts riots, but this is when you start seeing different tactics by the police being applied towards the, the, the peace movement and, and towards Chicago or national, national minority movements. I'm mostly a public artist. You know, um, posters were early part of my, my life, but you could see where I get a lot of my influence and, and that anger showing through. Early on, I think my imagery was very confrontational. It would not leave room for the viewer to make his or her own interpretation of what the artist was trying to portray. So it was on in your face type of imagery, mm -hmm. where as you start growing and getting more mature, your imagery as an artist start getting a little bit more diplomatic. Mm -hmm. 
That doesn't, that's not to say that you sell yourself out. You bring the issue to the forefront, but you put it in such a way where the viewer makes its own interp interpretation. Like you put the image and use up to you to make your decision. So it becomes more diplomatic. It becomes more, um, more, accessible. more accessible. There's certain ways. So I use, I try to strategically look at my, uh, my imagery in a way where it raises the issue mm -hmm. to a point where it doesn't become confrontational. 